As I mentioned earlier, I'm really, really delighted to be back with you for service this evening because I'm, today is my first day back from vacation, so I'm really happy to be with you to share Shabbat tonight. Um, it is just a joy to be back with my community and the opportunity to pray and sing together. Uh, it was wonderful to have some time away to get a chance to get a little bit of a break from the heat and to see some beautiful parts of our country. Uh, one of the images from my time away that will stay with me is the image of a large isolated pine tree. It's a big tree that stands alone on top of a lonely outcropping of rock just off the coast of Lake Superior. The rock on which it stands is called Chapel Rock, and it is what remains of an ancient sandstone arch that was carved by water erosion about 3,800 years ago. That erosion sculpted the archway of rock which connected Chapel Rock to the mainland, but about 80 years ago or so, the arch collapsed into the lake, which left that isolated tower of stone, and on top of it, that single white pine tree. The tree is estimated to be about 250 years old, but it grows in a spot where there is not enough soil on that pillar of stone to sustain the tree's life. So how is it that this ancient and majestic tree continues to stand and to thrive? Well, when you get a bit closer to Chapel Rock, you'll see that there is a single thick skein of roots connecting the tree on the pillar to the mainland. At one time, those roots ran through the topsoil of the wall of rock, but now that the arch has collapsed, the tree is standed alone, stranded alone on top of Chapel Rock. But it lives on because it's connected to soil and water and nutrients by that thick, stubborn rope of root. If the root should become damaged or severed, of course, the tree will perish, but for now, it survives, clinging to life on the otherwise unforgiving stone of Chapel Rock. In our portion this week, we read what is probably the best known passage of biblical Hebrew. Six words that virtually every Jew in every part of the world knows by heart. It's Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, and it goes like this. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. These words are as familiar to us as our own names. Our tradition teaches us that the words of the Shema are so important that we ought to use them as the structural scaffolding upon which to build all the days of our lives. We're told to recite them as soon as we wake up in the morning like an anthem of loyalty. We're taught to whisper them quietly at night, so they'll be the last words on our lips before we fall asleep. And every time we gather together to pray in community, we sing these words together, the best known passage in our prayer book, as one community of practice and belief. It's happened on more than one occasion in my work as a rabbi that I'll go visit someone who's desperately ill in the hospital or someone who's receiving care at home for what may be their last hours or days of life. Often at these times, the person that I'm visiting, visiting is motionless, no longer responsive to conversation. Interaction with family and friends may have ceased completely. But sometimes even then, when the loved ones gather together at the bedside and they join together in reciting the Shema, the family is brought to tears to see their loved one's mouth moving, following along silently with the words that have been imprinted permanently in the deepest part of their memory and their being. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. The Shema has lodged itself deeply into Jewish life because it is perfectly structured, exquisitely simple and deeply complex at the same time, a proclamation of our faith in God and a reminder of our commitment to the covenant as members of Yisrael, the people Israel. When we sing it during services together, some of us close our eyes when we repeat those well-known words of Torah that our classical prayer book used to call the watchword of our faith. What I suppose those books meant by that is that every time we come back and return to the words of the Shema, we reaffirm our partnership with God. 
An ancient rabbinic tale sought to clarify when the first time was that the Jewish people recited the Shema in unison, just the way we do today. As the story goes, at the very moment when God revealed the first of the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, which enumerated God's commitment to the Israelites, I am the eternal your God, who led you out of Egypt to be your God. At that very moment, even before God finished speaking, unsurprisingly, the Jews interrupted to exclaim, yes, you are our God, and you are one. This tale teaches that the Shema's enduring power lies in the fact that at the same time it affirms God's sovereignty and it ties all of us together as one unified Jewish people. Observing the commandments, remaining aware of the sanctity of time and space, and working to bring wholeness to our world by elevating God's creations through the healthy functioning of moral and ethical lives. And so this proclamation of faith, which we understand as an expression of our belief that God is one, in practical terms also becomes a reminder that all of us, members of the Jewish people, we are all one too, bound together by the enduring bundle of connective threads that bind us one to the other. I've had on several occasions the good fortune to lead members of our congregation and others on travel adventures to tour Jewish communities in other parts of the world. I've had the privilege, along with some of you in this room tonight, to visit communities and congregations in all kinds of fascinating places. Often during these visits, we have the opportunity to visit synagogues, and we sometimes have to do our best to muddle through an unfamiliar worship service with customs or a language that we don't know. But every time, a marvelous thing happens, no matter where we are, in Poland or Hungary or Israel or India, when the leader of the service arrives at the Shema, a look of relief and familiarity washes over all the visitors. Everyone shares a grateful smile that says, ah, I know these words. These words are mine too. The words of the Shema which describe the intrinsic oneness of God are also a reminder of the Jewish imperative that we shouldn't be content to praise the oneness on high, but also to do our utmost to bring oneness to our world here on earth. Shema reminds us that we are obligated to undertake real projects of tikkun, of repair and healing, to bring what is fractured back into wholeness and unification once again. This is no small task. Our society often seems destined for brokenness. At times, it seems inevitable that human relationships and communities will fracture into tinier and sharper shards of pain and opposition. Tonight, we welcome Shabbat after a week that might easily see us drawn into hopelessness and despair. A worsening climate continues to pummel our planet. The brutality of war claims innocent lives in Ukraine and Russia. The Knesset's radical realignment of the judiciary in Israel is threatening to plunge the country into a full-scale constitutional crisis. It is almost too fitting that we commemorated Tisha B'Av yesterday, the day of Jewish communal mourning for the destruction of the ancient temples in Jerusalem. Our tradition asserts, remember, that those destructions were brought about specifically because of people's groundless hatred and unwillingness to compromise. The rabbis teach that our inability to be brought back into unification, into oneness, will lead us into unexpectedly painful experiences of suffering and loss. But this week, this Shabbat, is also called Shabbat Nachamu, Sabbath of Consolation. It's named for the opening words of the prophet Isaiah, whose calming words bring this Shabbat's Haftarah portion. Nachamu, Nachamu Ami. Comfort, oh, be comforted, my people, says your eternal God. Isaiah reminds us that even in the rubble of destruction, even then there is hope for unity and togetherness. Even in a world of separation and isolation and alienation, there is still hope for oneness and togetherness and unity 
amidst all of God's creations. Friends, the words of our Shema remind us to retain a belief in the potential of our world and in the capacity of human life. It is the core pronouncement of Jewish faith, our Jewish national anthem. Every time we repeat it in song or in prayer or in quiet personal meditation, we are reminded of the enduring oneness of God and the unity of the Jewish people. We keep its words with us until the last moments of our lives held close as part of our deepest and most precious memories. And those words tie us to those who came before us and to those who will live after us. And they nourish us through our lives, weaving us into the immortal pattern of Jewish life. Just like that thick and stubborn root that nourished that pine tree atop Chapel Rock, the watchword of our faith keeps us connected to the essential soil in which we thrive. They keep us connected quietly and reliably to our past and to our people, to our beliefs about the past and our commitment to the future. Our oneness tied to God's oneness, thriving together as an enduring tree of life. Shabbat shalom, everyone. <laughs>